Hi, okay, here's your first video for week two. We are going to start learning how to symbolize stuff in your first logical language, TFL, Truth Functional Logic. So we are, I'm going to give you sort of the basic building blocks you need here. There are really two core concepts that you'll need in order to um, get working on practicing problems. Those are atomic sentences and uh, truth functional connectives. Um, so I'm going to say a little bit about TFL symbolization in general, and then we'll talk about each of those two things in turn. And I will conclude with uh, some slightly trickier examples for you to work on on your own time. So, okay, coming back to our overview of this module as a whole, your introductory logic class, um, we are going to look at two kinds of logic, or, or if you like, two logical languages namely truth functional logic, which you are about to start learning, and first order logic, FOL, which you will learn uh, starting after the midterm. Um, truth functional logic is, uh, if you like, a proper part of first order logic. That is, um, all of the things that you learn in your truth functional logic class will still, all of the rules that you're gonna start practicing with will still apply in first order logic, but FOL will have uh, more moving parts. So it'll be uh, truth functional logic plus some extra stuff, some extra sophistication. Now, uh, these are not the only kinds of logic we could study, not the only logical languages you could learn, um, but they are the foundation for most other logics. So first order logic, as we're going to learn it, is sometimes these days called classical logic. Um, there are non-classical logics for sure. There are extensions of first order logic to deal with more stuff. There are, uh, as I say, um, alternatives that uh, give you uh, not not answers to further questions, but different answers to the same questions. Uh, but usually if you want to learn one of those things, um, you start by learning first order logic and then see how the alternative logic differs from it. So this is why I'm having you learn this thing. There is a philosophical question about like, what is the right logic for um, any given application? Um, that is a thing that we can talk about in particular cases if you're interested in it, but these are the basics. You got to learn this stuff before you get the other things. So as I said, TFL, there are two main things, two main sort of concepts you need to get to grips with um, to understand how the logic works, what its um, you know, uh, technical bits are. Uh, first one is atomic sentences. So let me get at what an atomic sentence is by giving you some examples to start with. So here's a sentence, Teresa is prime minister. This is no longer true. I told you I um, stopped updating my political examples. I haven't turned these examples into bird ones yet, but whatever, here we are. Um, Truman defeated Dewey. That's also an atomic sentence. It's also political, but like old, nobody's mad about Truman defeating Dewey anymore. You might not even know what I'm talking about. That's okay. Dublin is south of Belfast. Vladimir likes Donald. Donald likes Diet Coke. Okay. These are all atomic sentences. What do I mean by atomic? Um, here's the idea. Atomic sentences are uncuttable in the sense that they can't be broken down into components which them th themselves have truth values. Um, that might sound like a strange thing to say. Let me explain, first of all, why, why I'm talking about uncuttability. So um, for, for most of us these days, when you think about things that are atomic, or like atoms or something like that. You think of, you know, science and, um, or at least science fiction and chemistry and like all matter is made up of atoms and atoms have parts like with a nucleus and protons and electrons or something like that. The use of the word atomic that we're using here has um, in a sense an older history or a, or a common ancestor with um, that kind of atom. So the, uh, there was an ancient Greek school of philosophy called atomism. Uh, people like Democritus that uh, made this signature claim that um, all matter is composed of atoms, where by atoms they mean um, little tiny uh, building blocks that can't be split up any further. So, so the fact that now we think atoms can be split up into like their nucleus and and things like that um, is kind of confusing. But so the modern atomic chemistry um, started with, or the like atomic theory of um, 
matter as we understand it in science now started with somebody hypothesizing um, that matter is made up of these tiny little building blocks. We now think that um, those building blocks that were identified in, uh, I think the 19th century, um, those were not the smallest building blocks, right? It turns out that atoms themselves have parts and we can think about splitting the atom. Um, Democritus, somebody like Democritus would say, well, that just means those weren't atoms after all. Whatever the smallest thing is that you can't split up any further, um, that's what an atom is. Uh, the, that's, that's the etymology of the word. So um, my Greek isn't great, but um, as I understand it, the, the a here is a prefix like in atheist or agnostic, or there, there have to be some other a things or I think like the an in anarchy, it's a, it's a negation. So not, not what the, the tom, tomos part has to do with cutting. So something that can't be split down any further, that's an atom. Okay, that's the use that we are, that's the, the sense of atomic that we use in this um, module. Um, when we talk about atomic sentences, we mean sentences that can't be broken down in what sense? Can't be broken down into smaller parts that themselves have truth values. So take an example like the first one here, Teresa is prime minister. If you were in like an English grammar class, we'd certainly be happy to split this down into parts, right? There's, let's say a subject and a predicate, right? Or maybe we'd say there's like a, a generic um, noun here and there's a copula is that functioning as a copula whatever there's a verb there's a noun there's another noun uh, like linguists and literature people will happily split this down into parts um, but notice that none of those parts by themselves can be true or false is it true that teresa that doesn't make sense is it true that is prime minister well who's prime minister you need to fill something in so we can split these any of these sentences down into parts but those parts won't themselves be sentences they won't be parts that can be true or false. So similarly, Truman defeated Dewey, that's got parts. Um, it's in some sense importantly different uh, uh, in once we get onto FOL, first order logic, we'll see an important difference between these two kinds of sentence, although they are both atomic. This is a sentence that's about one individual person and telling you a property that that person has. This one tells you about two different people, Truman and Dewey, and tells you about a relationship between them. Um, this sentence about Truman and Dewey, as far as first order logic is concerned, is going to look a lot like this sentence about two cities. So the fact that this is a name of a person and this is a name of a city, not logically important, might be important like geographically or politically. Um, but as far as our logic will be concerned, not an important difference. And as far as TFL is concerned, all of these sentences look exactly the same. All of them are atomic. As far as truth functional logic is concerned, the only things we care about are things that can be true or false. Any smaller kind of part, so something that might be a name versus something that might be a predicate or a relation, as far as TFL is concerned, it just can't see that. It, it has no idea what to do with that information. All it wants to know about is um, things that are true or false. Okay, so our first building block, if we want to start um, composing sentences in the language of TFL is the idea of an atomic sentence. So an atomic sentence is an uncuttable sentence. Since it's a sentence, it's something that can be true or false. Since it's atomic, that means it has no uh, parts that are themselves sentences. Okay. But not all sentences are atomic. Here are some examples of non-atomic sentences. Donald likes Diet Coke if Vladimir does. Either Donald or Vladimir drank Diet Coke. Donald and Vladimir both drank Diet Coke. Vladimir did not like the Diet Coke. Okay, so why do I say these aren't atomic? Well, take the first one. Donald likes Diet Coke if Vladimir does. Again, we've got, you know, subjects and predicates and so on. Um, but notice here's a here's something here's a fragment of the original sentence donald likes diet coke that could be true or false likewise this here vladimir does that's that's um uh, elliptical uh for vladimir likes diet coke so we've got 
one thing that could be true or false, another thing that could be true or false, so two sentences, in fact, two atomic sentences, that are joined together with the word if. The if here is expressing some kind of connection between the truth of the sentence about Vladimir and the sentence about Donald. Okay, likewise here, um, if we're analyzing this second sentence grammatically, we might say the subject of the sentence is this phrase, either Donald or Vladimir, and the predicate is drank Diet Coke. As we're going to analyze this in TFL, we'll say something that, we might say the logical structure of this sentence is not exactly the same as the grammatical structure. Instead of saying there's this complex subject, we'll say this is joining together two atomic sentences by means of the word or. So what are the two sentences? First sentence, Donald drank Diet Coke. Second sentence, Vladimir drank Diet Coke. What we have left over are these words either or. Those are special logic-y words. In a second, I'll tell you that there's a connective that corresponds to them. So we're saying either Donald drank Diet Coke or Vladimir drank Diet Coke. So we have the two atomic sentences, Donald drank Diet Coke, Vladimir drank Diet Coke, and we're joining them together with an or, an either or. Same thing here, but with and and both. But the same two atomic sentences, Donald drank Diet Coke, Vladimir drank Diet Coke, are being joined together with a different joining word, a different connective. Okay, finally, this one. Vladimir did not like the Diet Coke. You might look at this and think, there's no part of this that is, there's no sort of proper part, something that is not the whole thing, but is just a part of it that is an atomic sentence, that is a sentence all by itself. Uh, but I think we can take out the word not. We're going to treat not as a special logic-y word. We're going to treat it as one um, that just applies to a single sentence. So whereas words like if, or or, or and, those want to join together two sentences, not is something that modifies a single sentence. So we start with the atomic sentence, Vladimir did like the Diet Coke, and we apply not to it to get its negation. Okay, so here's how TFL is gonna look at these sentences. It's gonna say each of these can be seen as built up from atomic sentences using the logical joining words or connectives, and, or, not, and, if, then. So. That brings us on to connectives, the other major thing that truth functional logic does. So atomic sentences are the smallest little bits you can get that, um, the smallest uh, sentences you can get, I suppose, um, that can be true or false, the smallest parts that can be true or false. We can get complex sentences by joining together atomic sentences using connectives. Okay. You have a limited list of connectives. I'm going to say they are truth functional connectives. We will learn what that means later this week or next week. Essentially, truth functional connectives, that means um, all that matters for the truth of a sentence involving a certain connective is whether its parts are true or false and which connective you have. But let's just start with learning what the list of connectives is. So, oh, I have this. I forgot that this was on the slide. Truth functional means, right, the truth value of a sentence composed of atomic sentences and truth functional connectives is a function, like in the mathematical sense, of the truth values of those atomic sentences. Uh, function in the mathematical sense, that is to say, uh, the truth value of this sentence composed of these things is completely determined by the truth values of the atomic sentences. But also, as I say, we'll worry about this next week. Don't worry about it for now. Okay, here are the five connectives. Not, or, and, if, then, which you've already seen. I'm gonna give you one additional one, if and only if. Remember this if with two Fs, that's short for if and only if. Um, you can think of if and only if as just like an if then, but in both directions instead of just one direction. We'll talk about that as we go. Okay, I'm gonna just give you some additional terminology. Uh, we have special names for um, sentences whose, uh, whose main connective is uh, any one of these things. So not sentences we call negations, or sentences we call disjunctions, and sentences we call conjunctions, if-then sentences we call conditional, 
if and only if sentences are biconditional, biconditional because there's like two if thens. Um, do notice you might have run into some of these words. So like the conjunction is uh, uh, a name for like a grammatical category of words um, in English. I think at least all of these things, at least both or and end would count as conjunctions in in as a matter of grammar rather than logic. Um, more or less anything that sort of joins together two sentences in the way that an and can counts as a conjunction. Um, but in this class, conjunction means and, and sentence. Um, and typically in philosophy, that's how that gets used. Disjunction means or. Okay. So we have uh, names for these kinds of sentences. I've, I've put all caps versions of the English words to highlight when I'm, I'm trying to use the connective. Um, you are going to have to start learning symbols. We're going to have symbols for these things. Here are the official symbols for your textbook for each of them. Not is a sort of a hooky, a, a sort of hook looking thing um, that sits right in, right in front of the sentence it's negating. Or disjunction sentences, that's a, a V sort of sign. And the symbol for that is an upside down V. Um, you might remember that as looking almost like a capital A. Or and and look similar, but they are different. They look similar because in a certain way that we will start exploring next next week, they're kind of like the reverse of each other. Um, but make sure that you can get straight on which one is which. So maybe a way to remember it is by means of that mnemonic for and, the, that, that wedge looks like a capital A once you take away the crossbar and or is the opposite. It's the one that isn't and. If then the symbol for that is an arrow pointing from one sentence to another. Um, and if and only if correspondingly is a double arrow pointing in both directions. Okay, there are those, th you need to know those five symbols. I'm going to give you some additional ones that are optional. The reason why is because, so these are, this is one standard set of symbols, but there are lots of other logic texts that teach the same logic, but sometimes use um, different symbols. So I'm just going to tell you for the record, here are some other things. Um, in fact, one of the uh, sources I've posted on Canvas of additional exercises uses these alternative symbols. So I'll tell you now what they are. Um, so not in our sentence, in, in our textbook is that hook. It's very often uh, symbolized with a tilde instead, this squiggle sign. Um, the or side, the or side, the V that we have, that is extremely standard. It's very rare to see anything else used for or. In some older textbooks, you will you will sometimes see it symbolized with a plus. That's pretty unusual. I don't think you'll run into it, but for the record, there you go. Um, and there are a couple of alternatives that you'll sometimes see. Sometimes you'll see an ampersand or sometimes a dot. Um, if then, the conditional for us is the arrow. Um, also very common is a uh, horseshoe. So the horseshoe with the, the, the open end pointing towards where the tail of the arrow would be. Uh, by conditional, you will sometimes see this symbol, like an equal sign with three bars. Okay, you don't have to memorize all of those alternative symbols, but they can be useful if you uh, decide to use a different textbook from ours. Okay, let's look at some example sentences and see how this sort of thing works. Uh, we're going to sort of not fully but partially symbolize some English sentences. So here's a negation sentence. Jeremy doesn't like Donald. One way we could write this is like this. So inside the parentheses, inside the brackets, I guess people in this country say brackets. I, I grew up learning that like brackets is the casual thing to call these. Uh, but formally you call them parentheses. And then once I started teaching over here, I found out that there are some students who are not familiar with that word at all. Um, so, right, call these brackets, call them parentheses, whatever you like. Brackets around the atomic sentence, Jeremy likes Donald. Right, Jeremy likes Donald, there we go. Nah, uh, I'm just trying to highlight the part in the middle. Um, put that inside brackets and then outside we'll write a not right in front of those brackets to say, I'm applying this truth function, this uh, special connective word, just to the thing inside the brackets. 
figure out what this sentence says, figure out whether that's true, and then do a negation on it. And we'll talk next week about what doing a negation to the thing actually involves. Okay. Here's an or sentence. If somebody says, uh, probably somebody old since they're talking about phoning, um, I'll text or phone you next week. So this looks to me like it's joining together the atomic sentences, I'll text you next week, I'll phone you next week, and doing that by means of the connective or. So we might write it like this. I'll text you next week, that's one atomic sentence. I'll phone you next week, that's the other one. And in between them, joining those two things together is our connective or. Okay. When we get to fully symbolizing things in TFL, I will use one kind of symbol for this atomic sentence, another kind of symbol for that atomic sentence, and the V symbol for the or, and that's what we'll write down. Worry about that later. Okay. An and sentence, if I want to say Jeremy is tall and thin, that looks like saying Jeremy is tall, Jeremy is thin, and joining them together with an and. If and only if. You'll pass the module if and only if you work hard at it. Similar thing again. Atomic sentence, you will pass the module. Atomic sentence, you will work hard at the module. Join together with an if and only if. Here's a conditional sentence. That last one was biconditional. This one is conditional. If then. Donald will be cranky if we don't get him some Diet Coke. Donald will be cranky if we don't get him some Diet Coke. There are two tricky things here uh, to watch out for that haven't happened in any of the sentences we've looked at earlier on this slide. Two tricky things. First tricky thing. The if-then connective is different from all of the other ones we've seen so far in that it's asymmetrical. There's a difference between if A then B and if B then A. So it matters what order we put things in. On the other hand, like if you say A and B, that means the same thing as B and A. A or B means the same thing as B or A. A if and only if B means the same thing as B if and only if A, because in both cases you've got sort of both arrows. So I look at this sentence. I'm going to try and break it down into atomic sentences. So Donald will be cranky. Uh, we won't get Donald's on Diet Coke. That sounds maybe like two um, atomic sentences. But now I have to decide which one goes first if I'm going to make this into an if then. And this can be really tricky because in English, like I said in the other video, I think I said this in another video, um, in English, as in probably every single natural language, there are lots and lots of different ways of expressing conditional sentences. If then is one way of doing it. Sticking an if in the middle of the sentence is another way. So if you want to make sure that you write the correct thing, put your, your uh, arrow symbol in the correct place, you're going to have to think about, if I were going to rephrase this in the form if A then B, would that be if Donald will be cranky then we don't get him some Diet Coke? Or would it be if we don't get him some Diet Coke then Donald will be cranky? I think it's that latter one. So I think when we symbolize this, we're going to have to write something like this. So we're moving that second part to the beginning. If we won't get Donald some Diet Coke, then Donald will be cranky. This sentence means the same thing as the original. If I switch these two, if I switch the beginning and end, the antecedent and consequent as they're called, we get something that means something different. Okay, the uh, rule of thumb that works for me is when you've got an if in the middle, think of it as sticking to the thing that comes after it, if we don't get him some Diet Coke. So if I want to rephrase this as if then, if A then B, the if has to stick to the thing that it was on before. So I have to say, if we don't get Donald some Diet Coke, then the rest of the sentence. Okay, that was all one way that this is different from the sentences we saw before. Take a second and see if you notice anything else. A little bit trickier. From the previous examples, I'll talk slowly. Now we'll point out these two sentences in the brackets are not both atomic. Which one's not atomic? It's the first one. There's a not in there. So that's another thing to notice in TFL. You, there's sometimes more than one connective in a sentence. Sometimes even the things inside the sentences need to be broken down. So we won't get Donald some Diet Coke. I can symbolize that as not we get Donald some Diet Coke. Okay, 
But notice also there's an order to the connectives, right? This not is applying just to the thing inside the brackets. It's not a negation of the whole if then sentence. That would again express something different. Okay, those are the basics. That's that's the beginning. I want you to think about so read the textbook. It'll give you some sort of preliminary guidelines for going from English into uh, this kind of like first step to symbolization, right? Replacing like an English or with the sort of properly TFLized or connective in all caps that only wants to sit in between complete sentences rather than sitting like in between text or phone, which are not each individually sentences. Go try and get some practice with that reading the textbook. Um, on the next slide, I'm going to give you some tricky examples where just like replacing a, a normal English word with an all caps word might not work correctly. And we can talk in the drop in sessions uh, about what you think about all of these. So I'm just going to give them to you. I'm not going to ask you. Um, uh, I'm not going to tell you here what uh, is tricky about any of these, but I want you to think about them. So here's a sentence. Scotland is part of the UK, but it might not be for long. So notice none of our five connective words are in here. There's no not, there's no or, there's no and, there's no if then, there's no if and only if. Um, but this doesn't look like an atomic sentence. So what connective should we use? Think about it. Um, if all sides of a rectangle are of equal length, then it is a square. So this has got if then in it. But I want you to think about what the speaker, somebody who writes this, where would that show up? That's This is the sort of thing that you might write like as a definition of a square. If you're giving a definition, would you use a conditional sentence or something else? Something else. But if it's not the conditional, then which connective is it? Justify your answer. Um, you'll pass the module only if you sit the exam. So here we have a sentence with an if in the middle of it but it's got an only on it. So I want you to think about, again, with those conditional sentences, it's not if and only if, it just says only if. So I want you to think about what's the right order for the, those two parts if we're going to make this a conditional sentence. Maybe helpful contrast. You'll pass the module if you sit the exam. Notice that this doesn't mean the same thing. You'll pass the module only if you sit the exam. You'll pass the module if you sit the exam. We did talk about this in one of the um, this example in one of the uh, drop-in sessions last, last week. So some of you might um, have heard an answer to this, uh, but maybe convince yourself that it's correct. I really hope that you understand the difference between these two sentences because I might say these things to you at various points in the course, uh, in the module, and mean different things. Make sure you see what the differences are. How about this? The peanut is neither a pea nor a nut. This is another case where it looks like we've got. Um, we do not have an atomic sentence, but none of our official uh, list of five connective words appears here. We have neither nor. That's not either or. That's not both and. Try to come up with, uh, try to, there is, there is more than one way to symbolize this sentence, to break this thing down into connectives. I will tell you, you're going to need more than one. See if you can find at least one way of symbolizing this using the five connectives that we have, some combination of some of those five connectives. You won't need all of them. If you can come up with a way to do it using all five, tell me about it. That might be neat. I don't know if you can do it. Um, Trudeau is the Canadian prime minister, but I didn't vote for him. Again, you'll need multiple connectives. See what you can do. You'll fail the module unless you sit the exam. Again, tricky. Um, we are going to talk a lot about unless sentences. They are, they are very, very tricky. There are multiple ways to symbolize unless sentences. There will definitely be unless type sentences that I ask you to symbolize on the midterm and uh, probably on the final exam too. Uh, the textbook talks explicitly about what to do with unless. I will give you multiple strategies for them, but see, see what you come up with on your own. Again, you'll probably need not necessarily, but you will probably need multiple connectives. See what you can do. Um, what else have we got? Barack and Michelle are married. I will leave you to think about what might be tricky about just treating this as a straightforward end sentence. 
Uh, hurry or you'll miss the train. Is this really an or sentence? When would you say this? Hurry or you'll miss the train. How would we write that? Okay, I'm going to leave you to think about those things. We will talk about uh, all of this stuff some more later on this week. Thanks, guys.